Okay. All right, guys, we're going to go ahead and get started with our evolution review. So, um, first, I figured we'd start with the beginning, how life probably first evolved. There are a number of theories. Uh, we're going to go over them very quickly because we've got a lot of stuff to do. So, um, Oparin and Haldane were two of the scientists who put forth this primordial soup hypothesis that there was a bunch of stuff floating in the primordial oceans. And with the energy from either ultraviolet radiation or lightning, these things reacted and they were able to form organic molecules. Then those organic molecules were able to those organic molecules were able to aggregate or bunch up together and form these coacerbates, which you should remember from the lab we did towards the beginning of the year. Um, and so these coacerbates are basically like proto-cell membranes, and as they were able to acquire different organic molecules, they could take on more and more properties of life. There are some problems with this. For one thing, we don't know the exact composition of the atmosphere back there. Uh, back then, and um, there are some chemicals that this, uh, this hypothesis has trouble uh, determining how they were synthesized. Um, there was also the Miller-Urey experiment, and what it did is it was simulating the hypothesized conditions on ancient Earth. So there was a mix of gases put into here, which is what we, or what they theorized that the composition of the Earth's atmosphere was at that point. There was a spark, which was representing the energy from lightning. And then all of this stuff was allowed to go down a cooling tube where it condensed, simulating rain. And then it would come here where you could collect. And then it would also end up here where you could heat it, and that would simulate the evaporation of water. And so all of this simulated some key components. Um, the basic building blocks of these organic molecules, an energy source, and the source of water. And when they collected from this tube, what they noticed is they had a lot of the basic building blocks of organic molecules. Some uh, amino acids were there, some building blocks of nucleotides were there as well. The major problem with this though, was that it turns out the mixture of gases that they hypothesized for the uh, primitive atmosphere was wrong. There's also the RNA world hypothesis, which was um, put forth, well, the scientists aren't important, not that they're not important in general, but for the AP test. Um, this was hypothesized because of the discovery of ribozymes. So ribosomes, like we talked about today, are enzymes that are capable of catalyzing chemical reactions. And so the thought was, you know, all the complex things we have that have evolved from going from DNA to making mRNAs to using ribosomes to make proteins, that would have taken time to evolve. So the thought was, what if the jobs of two of those different types of molecules could be done by one? And so that's where they got the thought, what if ribosomes were the ones that were actually catalyzing those, in those early reactions? And so it was RNA-based. They wouldn't have had to make a protein yet. And so that kind of simplicity was, um, was theorized as being a possible way that uh, living organic molecules could have evolved. Um, and, you know, some supporting evidence, there are ribosomes uh, that are present today. There are ribosomes, which are mostly RNA and do catalyze the synthesis of proteins. But there are some problems. It doesn't explain, for example, how the first RNA was developed. So this could be something that might work in concert with one of the other hypotheses. Then there's also the extraterrestrial origins hypothesis, just because on meteors or uh, rocks that are coming in from outer space, they've detected some basic building blocks of organic molecules. So the thought is, if enough of these things hit the Earth, maybe they accumulated enough organic material to eventually give rise to living things. However, this is a really difficult hypothesis to test. You might have to like coat an asteroid in organic material and send it hurtling to the earth and nobody in their right mind wants to do that. Um, so those are the hypotheses on the origins of life. Let's fast forward about a billion years 
and we get to um, some geographic ev geological evidence that there was a sudden buildup of oxygen in the atmosphere. And who do we know that makes oxygen? Plants. Plants. Now, back then, all life was single celled, so there wouldn't have been any plants, but their precursors, photosynthesizing bacteria, or photosynthesizing prokaryotes, would have been around and would have been capable of producing oxygen. So this is some evidence that photosynthesis had probably not only evolved by two and a half billion years ago, it had probably evolved a little earlier than that because you would have needed time for the oxygen to build up. So we have some evidence of our earliest, most primitive photosynthesizing organisms. Um, this is just a general timeline. What I wanted to point out though was that, so this is like, the origin of photosynthesizing organisms. This spiraling thing is showing the major mass extinctions that have existed throughout geologic time. And so about two and a half billion years ago, you had the great dying that was precipitated by buildup of oxygen. A lot of bacteria that probably existed before that were anaerobic, meaning that they would die in the presence of oxygen because they didn't use it. Um, and so probably a lot of things died at that time. We've had a number of mass extinctions since then. A lot of times what drives the mass extinction is either some sort of catastrophic event like a volcano erupting or an asteroid colliding or some sort of massive climate shift. So if you have um, uh, like a global warming event, which has happened a couple of times in the history of the Earth, or if you have an ice age come along, if it triggers a rapid enough shift in climate, Organisms aren't able to adapt quick enough, and so they die. And some of these have been, re when I say mass extinction, I mean really massive. Uh, there have been times when 90 plus percent of all the species on the planet have disappeared. So it seems like we're kind of lucky life has come close to being wiped out a couple of times. Though usually after life has been uh, wiped out, after we've had one of these mass extinction events, um, there is an explosion of diversification in what's left behind. So for example, the fact that we are here as mammals is due to the fact that we had that massive extinction which killed the dinosaurs. And because of that, all those empty niches that were now available were filled by our mammalian ancestors. So let's look at evidence of common ancestry. So a few things point to the fact that all living things share a common ancestor. And from that, we draw the conclusion that life evolved once on Earth, and then all life that currently exists was coming from those, those organisms that first evolved. So we have a universal genetic code. We have that giant codon chart that we generally look at to um, see what uh, codons represent what amino acids. And that is almost universal. There are a couple of exceptions to that. A few species of bacteria that may be different by one codon or more. But for the most part, it is very universal. There's also the fact that in all organisms that are alive, with the exception of the non-living viruses, which use some of the same molecules, um, that information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. And we use them in similar ways. We all have some polymerases making copies of DNA. We have RNA polymerases making our mRNA. And we all have ribosomes that are making our proteins. So this similarity, not only in the genetic code, but also for the molecular structures of molecules is going to be a, a piece of evidence for our common ancestry. There's the fact that we use uh, the same nitrogen bases in our DNA and RNA. There are more than the nitrogen bases that exist in our current DNA and RNA, but none of those other ones are found in living creatures. There's also actually more than 20 amino acids that exist, but we only use 20, and most living things on the planet use those same 20. They don't use any of these other ones that exist. So that's also some evidence that we all share common ancestry. We also have similar metabolic pathways. So if you look at how we break down sugar and get energy from it, um, it's very similar across different species. Yes, there have been some innovations. So when we talk about photosynthesis and cell respiration more next week, we're gonna talk about the fact that there are two major types of cell respiration, one with oxygen and one without oxygen. The one without oxygen can be performed by most organisms on the planet. 
and we perform it in pretty much the same way. You can look at some of the enzymes that work on us for this anaerobic respiration, the one without oxygen, and they're very similar to the enzymes that function in bacteria or plants, etc. So there is that similarity as well. There's also evidence that all eukaryotes have a common ancestor, the similarities in our mitochondria, and the fact that our internal structures are uh, pretty similarly organized is evidence of that. Also the fact that we have multiple linear chromosomes. So not all eukaryotes are the same, but our mitochondria are similar enough that they probably came from the same ancestral prokaryote that ate an uh, ancestor of mitochondria and then ended up living in an endosymbiotic relationship with it. So let's talk phylogenies now. So we've talked about common ancestry. Now let's put that together in some visuals. So uh, it's very important to be able to interpret and read some of these diagrams, including a cladogram. So cladograms are going to show relatedness, but they don't indicate any time. They don't tend to have um, any information about genetic differences. So it's not like you can look on here and think, oh, these iguanodontids are as related to hadrosaurs as ceratopsians are related to pachycephalosaurs. Oh, that's a lot of dinosaur names. Um, you can't get that from this. You can only derive the fact that there are certain traits that arise. So for example, everything after this line um, has the upright posture, bipedal locomotion, lives on land, regionalized vertebrae, etc., etc. So everything that comes after this point that branches off has that trait. Um, you can also use it to examine common ancestry. So you can say that, for example, iguanodontids are more closely related to hadrosaurs than they are to any other species on here because they share a more recent common ancestor. So the more recent the common ancestry, the closer the relationship. Any questions? This is another very important type of uh, um, diagram. It's a phylogenetic tree. This has a little more information in it. It doesn't have the traits listed, but in theory, the distances that you see here are supposed to reflect evolutionary distance, so evolutionary relatedness. So here you could say that, for example, um, Ehrlichia chaffensis and Ehrlichia morris are probably more closely related to each other than Anaplasma phagocytophila and Anaplasma platus, just because their distance is closer together. Okay? And then I have not seen one of these show up on the AP test, but you never know they could pull one of these out. Um, so, chronograms, chronograms actually show time. So, the, the branches have a length that's proportional to the amount of time that has passed, um, and they do split when you have a speciation event, and they end when a species goes extinct. So you can see, for example, that this little dot right here, whatever species that was, went extinct a long time ago during the Triassic period, whereas this guy right here went extinct sometime during the Cretaceous period. So. When you put these three diagrams together, you can gather a lot of information, but it's hard to put all that information into one diagram. So you have these different things. The most common things I've seen on the AP test questions are cladograms and phylogenetic trees, especially on free response questions where they ask you to draw your own phylogenetic trees. Usually what they'll have is they'll have like the, they'll have all the lines set up for you and you'll have to put the names in. So that is a little helpful in that if you see these two lines are clustered together, you know those are two closely related species. Um, I was going to have us make a phylogenetic tree. Do you guys think we have time for that? We have 45 minutes. Yes, no? Okay, I guess I'm going to end up on camera unless that thing has stopped recording. So, you always start at one end with whatever the common ancestor was. Now we look at the traits we have. Is there any trait that all of these organisms share? So they all have hearts with chambers. So this needs to have developed in their common ancestor. Now, after hearts with chambers, 
which is right here. Is there anything that only has that trait and lacks all the others? The hagfish. So the hagfish branched off before anything else. All right. What is the trait now that is shared by all the rest of them except the hagfish? The rest of them have jaws, so we continue along. All right, is there anyone who has jaws but lacks all the other traits? Shark. Shark. All right, so what do you think I'm going to put next? What trait? Bony skeleton. Bony skeleton. And who branches off after bony skeleton? All right, so can we kind of see how this ends up? So at the end of every line, you're going to have a species. And by looking at that species and tracing its line back, you can tell what characteristics it has. So for example, a hagfish only has a heart with chambers. It doesn't have any of the other characteristics. Whereas a toad has not only a bony skeleton, it also has jaws and it has a heart with chambers. Does that seem relatively easy to read? Sweet. Erase it. All right, moving on. So this is some of the stuff that I didn't get to cover in class, but there is genetic evidence that we're able to get from extinct organisms now. So they, scientists have been able to extract DNA from the bones and fossil remains of extinct organisms and actually sequence it. So for example, recently they completed the Neanderthal genome. So they know most of the genome of Neanderthals enough that they were able to look and see that there are some humans alive today who have some of these Neanderthal genes, which is evidence that at some point in the past, the two species interbred. The same thing is, applies to another group, uh, the Denisovans. Uh, their remains, there are very few of them, but they were in like, I think Siberia and some mountains up there. And they were able to gather enough DNA to sequence their genome and compared it to both Neanderthal genomes and human genomes. And they found, um, for example, Tibetans have several traits that the Denisovians have. Mm -hmm. Neanderthals were uh, related species. They had enough differences that for a while we considered them a separate species. They were kind of shorter, more compact. Their bodies were more adapted to the cold. They're kind of where we get that stereotype of a caveman. Though more and more evidence is showing that they had culture, they took care of the sick, they buried their dead, they may have had a little art. And for a while people thought that they just completely went extinct, but now we know that some of them at least interbred with humans. So humans kind of got around with the other species. And so because of that, we can modify the existing phylogenetic trees that we already had to say, okay, well, it's probably not that Homo neanderthalensis and Homo sapiens split. It's probably they were part of the same species. And these guys, neanderthalensis and the Denisovans and sapiens, which is us, probably are subspecies because of the interbreeding capability. Um, and this is another thing I didn't cover when we were in class, adaptive radiation, is usually when you have um, an organism end up colonizing a new area, whether it's an island or whether it's empty niches left over after a mass extinction, they'll usually have a very rapid um, development of multiple species from that one ancestor. So the example here is off the coast of South America, you have the Galapagos Islands. Well, back in the day, an ancestral pair of finches ended up landing on that island. Well, their babies had all these empty niches. There were no other finches there. So um, you had a rapid speciation develop where within a few generations, maybe, you had some that were starting to specialize on eating cactus, and you had some that were starting to specialize on eating nuts, and you had others that were starting to specialize on digging in trees to get insects out. And so within a relatively short period of time, Keep in mind, the timeline of evolution is generations. So it's like hundreds or thousands of years. Um, but within a relatively short time for evolution, you have this rapid development of a number of species. 
there was actually a radiation of mammals after the dinosaurs went extinct, where there was just this very quick, very large um, evolution of a number of different species of mammals. All right, um, another type of evolution that can affect traits is convergent evolution. It's when uh, multiple species end up living in similar niches, uh, and so they develop similar traits. So for example, um, wings have evolved four times in the history of evolution that we know of. Uh, bats, birds, insects, and what's not shown up here are like pterodactyls, so the reptilian uh, winged creatures. And so these uh, three different, or the four different types of organisms were trying to fill the same niche, being able to live at least part of the time in air and hunt from there, or escape into the air. And so they develop these outwardly similar structures. You can tell some similarities between the general shape of a bat wing and a bird wing and an insect wing, but they are derived from different um, ancestral parts, so they're not homologous to each other, and they'll have different internal structures. Like if you look at the wing of a bird, notice there are no bones going down into the wing. That's all like soft tissue and then feathers connecting. Whereas in a bat, the bird, I mean the bones go all the way down to the wing tip. <coughs> So those are some structural differences that show that these did not evolve at the same time. Parallel evolution can also happen. It's a form of um, it's a form of convergent evolution. If you're evolving in similar niches in different locations, you can develop uh, similar traits. So, for example, marsupials mostly live in Australia nowadays. Um, placentals, mammals, live all over the rest of the world. So kangaroos, koalas, all of those are marsupials. Well, before a lot of people moved over there and, you know, leading, started introducing species and a lot of things going extinct, they actually had a lot of marsupial um, mammals that were very similar to placentals. So they had like a marsupial wolf-looking animal, there was a marsupial tiger, um, and a lot of these marsupials that looked outwardly similar to the placental mammals we're used to seeing. Unfortunately, a lot of them are extinct now. Okay, then evolution can happen at different speeds. Now, both of these tend to happen over the course of the evolution of a species. It just depends on how the environment changes. So, there's either gradualism, um, that's when evolution is happening very slowly and you're building up small changes and it's constantly occurring, or there's punctuated equilibrium, where a species will stay the same for a while, and then there'll be a rapid change, and it'll be a rapid semi-dramatic change. So this is just a phyletic image of that, so you can see with the gradualism, you're seeing these gradual changes, and with punctuated equilibrium, you're like the same, and then bam, really dramatic change. Also, uh, with the AP question we were going over yesterday, I decided we needed to go over genetic drift too. This is a change in your gene pool due to chance. So for example, let's say we had a bunch of sheep. Some of the sheep are brown and some of the sheep are white. And they go through a valley in between two mountains and a landslide happens. That landslide just accidentally takes out most of the brown sheep. Now there's only like two brown sheep and 200 white sheep. Did the brown sheep die because they were not as good as uh, adapted to the mountain area? Did they have an uh, like a reproductive disadvantage? No, they just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. So I like to think of it drift. If you're drifting on the ocean, do you have a purpose? No, if you're drifting, you're not steering yourself, and where you end up partially depends on chance. So that's how you remember genetic drift is chance. Um, you can also have a bottleneck event. This is what happens when a large part of your population dies. So a lot of your population dies off, like right here, this is a graph of population. And what can happen is that can change your gene frequencies. So notice we have here, we have a number of different colors. Each of them represents a different trait, so a different allele. After a bottleneck event though, maybe only the red and the blue ones survive. So the population that arises from that, they can only inherit the traits that their parents have. 
So they can only inherit the blue and the red. So none of the yellow, none of the green, none of these orange or the purple get passed on. So with the bottleneck event, you can lose a lot of your genetic variation. There's been evidence of bottleneck events in human history. There is a time when I think with genetic analysis, they think there was a time when the population of humans was down to like a few thousand people. Um, and there are population bottlenecks happening right now when species are becoming endangered. So for example, like, I know in the 90s, the population of uh, Florida panthers went down to like 50. So a lot of traits were probably lost uh, in that bottleneck event. Okay, let's go into natural selection. So remember, we all remember Darwin and natural selection. This was his mechanism for evolution <clears throat> that he proposed. And so what he also proposed was descent with modification. We descend from a common ancestor, but there were modifications that happened. And so that explains the differences between species and also why the different species aren't capable of interbreeding. So uh, definition for populations. A population is a group of individuals living in the same place at the same time who can interbreed, meaning they're part of the same species. Populations are the only things that evolve. Individuals don't evolve. So I'm sorry, you're, you're not going to evolve. But that's okay. Let's say some catastrophe happens. Some disease epidemic sweeps through humans. Well, Brenda individually may not evolve. In fact, any number of us may end up being wiped out by the disease, but the population of humans that is left afterwards will have changed their gene frequencies because of that disease. Seem okay? Mm -hmm. not, not that you didn't make it from the <laughs> disease, but... All right, so genetic variation is a very huge key to natural selection. Without genetic variation, we are all identical, we are all clones, and there's nothing for... Um, selective pressure to work on. <clears throat> so when you have natural selection and you have genetic variation, that is able to um, ha allow adaptations to arise. So the source of all genetic variation is mutations. That's the ultimate source. But we've also talked since we've covered evolution about some of the other sources that increase variation in the combinations of genes you have. So the big one is sexual reproduction, which does produce different combinations of genes. You have other things like crossing over events and recombination happening during uh, meiosis where chromosomes that are homologous swap genes. Uh, so you have also um, horizontal transfer in bacteria, which can share plasmids with each other. So even in asexually reproducing populations, you can have some genetic variation. Now, um, mutation rates are, for obvious reasons, pretty slow in, on the whole, especially in some of the more essential genes. So things like, for example, our homeobox genes or the gene that makes DNA polymerase are going to accumulate mutations very, very slowly because most of the time when there's a mutation in that gene, it'll result in a non-viable offspring, meaning it'll result in a termination of life. Sorry, I'm getting comfy. Um, and nearly all populations have variation, and variation for different traits too. Even bacteria have variation in their populations. So the gene pool is all of the different alleles you have for a specific locus, and a locus is a location on a chromosome. It's the site of a gene. So um, a gene pool is all of the alleles you have for a particular gene in a population. You could look at two different populations of the same species and find differences in their gene pool. One of the most obvious ones would be like uh, skin color or hair color in humans. If you look at a population in Norway, the gene pool will probably consist of a lot of blonde hair and paler skin. On the other hand, if you look at a population in, say, India, um, most of them are going to have dark hair and dark skin. So there are differences in gene pools depending on which population you look at. Um, from this, we can calculate the allele frequency. So we can calculate what percentage of our gene pool 
is the allele for blonde hair? What percentage is the allele for brown hair? And then we can also calculate genotype frequencies. So what percentage of our population is homozygous dominant? What population is heterozygous? What population is homozygous recessive? And you know that means the Hardy-Weinberg map is coming up. So selection is not done by a person or a thing. Selection is the result of environmental changes and the variation in a population. So we can refer to something called selective pressure, which is the um, kind of motivation or impetus to uh, have different combinations of traits to fit a particular environment. But it's not like there's some overseer going, no, nope, no, nope, you don't have the right traits, you, you're out of here. There's not actual like somebody selecting. Honestly, Darwin got this term from a lot of people were doing dog breeding in England around the time when he was coming up with his um, theory of evolution by natural selection, and they called the selection of different traits that they were breeding for artificial selection. So he was saying, as opposed to a human intelligence behind the selection, there was a natural process behind the selection. So that's what we mean by selection. So this will change the frequency of different traits of different alleles in your population. It can change from one generation to the next. And if you have enough dramatic changes, you can end up having speciation happen. And that's where you have a bunch of different organism types, um, species descending from the same ancestor. So if there is positive selection for something, then that means that uh, the individuals with that trait will survive better. They have um, more reproductive success. And when the environment changes, that can change what the selective pressure is and whether it's positive or negative. This is not actually uh, natural selection, that's artificial selection. All of these different types of foods, so broccoli, cab uh, cabbage, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, I think kohlrabi, and I don't know, that might be kale all were bred by humans from one ancestral wild mustard plant. So um, that was pressure that was artificial put on by humans. So these are the different principles of natural selection. So what Darwin said is, you make some